Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Because there were a number of seminal recordings that were influential during that time. And we're going to talk a little bit about that era because uh, we were both in Nuevo Orc during the 1970s, which dates us. Uh, and we're going to talk about what the environment was that sort of led up to the... Uh, we're going to start there. We're going to start with the environment that led up to your, uh, shall I say, being paired with Herbie? I guess you could say that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about like the whole club scene and everything that was going on in Disneyland for adults, a.k.a. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Disneyland for adults on acid. Pretty much, yes. The bad brown acid, acid. No, yes. The, the bad acid, hey, yes. Hey, hey Lenise. Uh, yeah, bad acid with uh, da danger, potentially very lethal and sometimes utterly deadly around every possible corner. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, but, but, but let's talk a little bit about the club scene and everything, because I know there were, a, that, that was a lot of the culture that fueled the whole, oh, I please. Didn't get, I didn't get out much unless I was playing a show, and I was an introvert, I was right. a complete show. Right, okay, yeah. Um, but, you know, the, all of downtown New York was basically just a, just a seething mass of, like, culture and art and <clears throat> people making all kinds of incredible music, like so many different, like, some of the greatest artists of the 20th century wound up in New York at this time. You know, guys like Jean-Michel Basquiat <clears throat> and Julian Schnabel. And, well, he wasn't, they weren't visual artists. <laughs> <laughs> Although they did have a look, yeah. Yeah, and anyway. they, didn't, they also didn't wind up there. They were from there. In fact, strangely enough, they used to jam with a downstairs neighbor of mine when I was like 11 or 12, and they played Down by the River. I shot my <laughs> Really funny. Those wind up being the Ramones. I could I could imagine that as a Ramones arrangement, but no, never mind. Anyway, let's yeah. go there. So let's but, talk a little bit about uh, you know the, the club scene and what you guys were being influenced by. It was it was just a sea of different cultures and different ideas and everything being brought to bear on the same spot. I mean, you got to remember that New York at this time was an actual ab absolute shithole, like. The, the economic system had fallen apart. It was going into bankruptcy. The, the federal government was saying, we're not going to bail you out. You guys are on your own. And uh, it, was, it, it was just a, a, a complete disaster. Meanwhile, it had an incredible like, a transportation system, ground and underground. And it was very inexpensive to live there. Artists from all over the country and all over the world were actually converging on this one spot to do what they did because it was cheap mm -hmm. and it was accessible and you were ba and they everyone knew that there were other artists that were coming to this place yep. it was an absolute madhouse at a, at a certain point you just it, you just feel this electricity in the air like i've never experienced anything like it before i would go so far as to say that this was like the last great sort of cultural and art renaissance that has happened and probably will happen in Western civilization. That's what it was like. It was incredible. At least in the East Village. What's that? At least in the East Village. No, not just the East Village. <laughs> Anywhere from 14th Street down mm -hmm. from west to east. It was extraordinary. And again, it was a complete fucking cesspool. You know, like, once you got... And you mean that in the nicest way, of course, yes. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when you... <laughs> no, when you got into... When you got below 14th Street and you started to go further east, you were heading into Alphabet City. So once you got past like First Avenue and you got to Avenue A, I'd say after about like 13th Street, you didn't want to go to Avenue B because that's when that's when it was trouble. Mm -hmm. And you did like on some blocks, you didn't know if you walked a few feet too far in the wrong direction if you were going to be able to come out ambulatory or you were going to come out like uh, you know head first on a gurney. Mm. Like, that's what it was like. It was crazy. Buildings were burnt out. You know, people were playing in, in like, 
in sewer water and like, I mean, it was like, you see photos of this when you look for it and that's exactly what it was like. There were some blocks where, I, I didn't even realize this until later, but um, drug lords actually owned entire blocks. We're not talking uptown, we're talking about like yeah. east, the lower yeah. east side. Mm -hmm. You know, where cops didn't even go. It was crazy. And all this stuff was happening at the same time. So it was incredible. And, you know, I was in a band called Material at that point, and uh, with a bass player named Bill Laswell, who some of you may be familiar with. And we were... <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, we'd, we'd just be walking around the neighborhood, and you'd just... Any, you, anywhere you'd walk, anytime you'd go out, you'd run into one of your compatriots or colleagues. You know, we were all interested in what each other was doing, but at the same time, we were fiercely competitive. So there was always this kind of like, you know, sense of like, yeah, fuck you, you know, kind of thing. But at the same time, it's sort of love you, brother. Fuck you. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you're talking about like an entire culture that's existing in in this one area, and it's all over. Like it's taken over everything. And it was, and it was, you know, there was nothing to get it, to interfere with it. There was no, no fiscal reality that people had to deal with because you could live downtown and be dirt fucking poor. It was incredible. I knew, I think I told you this story about I visited a friend who, had a, who lived in a loft on 2nd Avenue between 12th Street and 13th Street. The loft took up the entire block between 12th and 13th. It was just pure open raw space. And he was an artist. He paid about $300 a month for that. Did he have electricity? Because um, some of those, I, I had friends sure there who were running. Had no, I had friends who were running things on old car batteries. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he may have had mm -hmm. like a pit in the middle of the place that they still need a fire or something. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> yeah, it was pretty rough. So anyway, let me redirect you as far as the stuff that you now you mentioned working with Bill. Yeah. Uh, which material was a band and kind of evolved into more of a production team. And you guys were starting to go to like the Roxy and these clubs and starting to work with artists. I mean, I know you did uh, the Nona Hendrix stuff and a few, a few other things. So you, you didn't just, what I'm trying to do here is lead up to the introduction of Herbie. You guys just didn't come out of nowhere. You had already been establishing something of a reputation. Yeah, I mean, we've been working for a while, but we were doing more avant-garde type stuff. And gradually, I don't even remember how we wound up going to the Roxy, but all of a sudden, there it is, like hip hop in all its in all its finery, you know, circa 1980, and it was just it was mind blowing. In the midst of all this incredible stuff going on, this whole new music form is starting to take root, and everyone's going like, "What the hell is this?" Like it was amazing. We go to the Roxy like just about every Friday night because that was hip hop night. It was actually a roller rink um, during most of the the week, and uh, you know, basically. People would just converge on this place. It would just be slammed with people, and it was like I think it held like two, three, four thousand people, maybe. Wow. Yeah, it was insane. And they'd just be blasting hip hop, and there'd be like b-boy competitions and people doing like hip hop. Uh, I mean, scratching uh, competitions as well. And there was graffiti art that people would, you know, would, would be featuring all over the place. It was it was just an extraordinary atmosphere. And this was hip-hop pre-samplers. Right? This, was, this was seriously like vinyl driven in you that sense. You had vinyl and you had drum machines and that was it. I yeah. Mean, yeah. The, uh, Different art form than what we know of hip-hop today. Yeah, the DMX had just, the Oberheim DMX had just been introduced. That was like one of the formative drum machines and it really had a particular type sound. And <clears throat> a lot of hip-hop artists had, had started using that. I mean, it, I think originally the electro hip-hop movement they were using TR-808s, which is an electronic, everyone has to know that one. Um, but yeah, they started moving toward DMXs and stuff with like drum samples, things like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about the, the odd little connection that led you guys to Herbie and this, the circumstance behind it, because it was anything but business-like in that sense. It was more like just like, hey, you want to do this, right? Uh, no. Well, oh, come on, <laughs> tell, tell the story then. Tell the story, don't make me prompt you. Uh, I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Herbie had a guy working with him named Tony Myland, who was his assistant, and uh, 
think Tony was angling for Herbie's manager's job, who isn't doing such a great job at that point, I don't think. But so, ter so Tony wanted to hook Herbie up with Bill and our drummer at the time, this guy Fred Mark. He wanted to get him to play on a record that he was going to do, which wound up being, um, oh, I don't remember the name of it, Adrian Ballou is on it. Um, it was one of Herbie's last records for, um, or would have been one of Herbie's last records for Columbia at that point. So that whole thing just sort of went, it fell through, it didn't go anywhere. And um, we forgot about it. Then all of a sudden Tony shows up again. And this time he's like, all right, this is Herbie's last record for Columbia. He's gonna get the boot. <laughs> like he's done, because he's not selling <laughs> records. You know, like they didn't want to know about him anymore. He, and Herbie at that point, he was making a lot of money going to Japan and playing jazz shows there, and he could have had a really good career for the rest of his life doing just that. But they were kind of, Columbia was like, welcome. And um, Tony was like, you know, this guy, we can still do something amazing with him. But we have to figure out something clever. So it was time for a Hail Mary. So Tony is like, we want you guys okay, Oops. to come on with. <laughs> okay. Just put that anywhere. Oh, okay. It's good where it is. Can't fall anymore. You can have it. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. I'll probably need it later anyway. Um, <laughs> so, Tony's like, we want you to do two tracks for Herbie's next record. We're going to get a bunch of producers. And, uh, you know, you'll be, you know, a couple, some of the producers that wind up making this record. And we're kind of, okay, this is exciting. Because we had been working very conceptually at that point, like just trying to figure something new out that no one else had really ever done before. And as you know, at that point in time, people were starting to actually release records that, had, that were hip hop influenced. Yeah, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. The beginning of sample clearancing. Uh, mm -hmm. No, that didn't come until much, yeah, yeah. much later. Yeah, okay, the beginning of sample stealing. Sample stealing. <laughs> um, people, yeah, actually, well, Planet Rock was definitely, that, well, that's not sure. a sample. That's, that, that's actually just the idea, mm -hmm. which Kraftwerk took them to the cleaners for. Um, which is obviously a very formative record and it was a big hit. And then there, was, uh, there were other things like uh, uh, Rapture, the Debbie Harry song, which is, I think a lot of people know. Really? Really? Did we have, we have, we have the there. illustrious Lenise Bent no. right you there. Who was that? We were on the panel together. Well, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old to remember stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, good for you. That's amazing. Um, and then there were a couple, there were a bunch of other records, um, like, of course, Buffalo Gals, the Malcolm McLaren record. Oh, yeah. Which is another, basically, a novelty record, The mm -hmm. Message. The Message. Rapper's yeah. Delight, mm -hmm. and, of course, Numbers by Crackwork, which is, those are, like, some of the most important records that really are at the, at the heart of what started, I think, the groundswell of hip hop going more mainstream. So we had all these ideas to work with, and we had connected already with the energy of hip hop. But we were kind of like looking at Herbie, who's basic. I mean, there's no nice way to frame it. He was basically at the end of his career. He was an he old was jazz an, dude. He was an yeah. old jazz, but yeah. he'd actually, but he'd been trying to make pop records. Yes, and synthesizers too. He'd been starting to dabble with synthesizers. Is that right? Been, uh, he was working with synths for a long mm -hmm. time. I mean, Chameleon was like 73 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And that was that's classic. You know, but the pop records he did, like, no one was connecting with. And to be perfectly honest, they weren't that great. You know, so we looked at Herbie and we were like, to conceptualize this, what would a guy like this, a guy who'd been, who was a trendsetter, who changed effectively the world of music, he'd involved, he'd incorporated electronics in a way that no one else had before him. You know, what would this guy have, have been doing? What would he, who would he be if he just continued on that arc, hadn't gotten into the pop music, and it sort of like stuck to this path of trying to change things, and all of a sudden he comes smack face to face with hip hop. What would happen, right? And that was the basis on which we started plotting out what we were gonna do next. 
but you had no input from him or his people in terms of what you were going to do, right? I mean, this, you were pretty much just like, hey, do us some tracks. I told you it was a Hail Mary on their part. <laughs> they had no fucking idea. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't even have planned for it, which is what made it so great in the long run. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Took them completely by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't know what hit them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the some of the interesting chances that you took in terms of doing this. I mean, this was not typical of even a hip hop record at that point. I mean, you guys were grabbing all sorts of instrumentation from everywhere and, and really kind of everything but the kitchen sink or was, was there a sink in there too? <laughs> in the video. Wow, well, that's right, that's right, yeah. Well, the, the thing about it is that you couldn't I mean, who were we back then? You know, we were basically a bunch of street kids <laughs> who'd, gotten, who'd gotten this incredible opportunity dropped in our laps. So it's the kind of thing where you couldn't, just, you couldn't fuck it up. There was just absolutely no way that you could do it wrong because it was just so in the ether. I mean, we're looking at a, a famous artist who's at the end of his career making records, at least for a major record label. label. And were these guys who got tasked to produce two tracks for him? Like, honestly, like, how could you fuck that? <laughs> you know. Also, it's, it's at a time where it's a musically, just in terms of genres. I mean, taking a slight digression here, right now is a period in time where everything is so genre specific. I mean, you can't move outside of a genre if you want to do anything that's going to be in the mainstream at all. Right? But back then it wasn't like that at all. Yeah, everything was mixed. You uh, could yeah. mix stuff up, and mm -hmm. one of the reasons was is that no one had, had ever heard a lot of the, the ideas combined that people were thinking of, so no one really know what kind of you know, lanes to tell you to travel in. Like, there was no, you can't do this, you can't do that, because no one knew it was coming. Right? Well, and there was no real playlisting in that sense either. I mean, you, even, even in commercial pop, like AM radio at the time, or FM radio at the time, mm -hmm. You know, you could go from, you know, you could go from an R&B track to, uh, you know, a hard, a hard rock guitar track, to, and and, you know, there 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 was really a, a blending of genres much more so than there is now. Well, yeah, I mean, another example of that is a, a Clash song, "Magnificent Seven, which oh, there is one you go. of the ones that I left yeah. off that list before, because it was so groundbreaking. I mean. If you really listen to the song, it's, it really is just a rock song with like a boom, that, boom, that. But for some reason, the fact that it came out the way it did, and the guy's trying to half-heartedly rap over it, you know, <laughs> and it's sloppy and everything else, it got, I mean... That's it what was, made it, though. It was yeah. all over R&B radio in New York. Like, you couldn't get away from it. Like, it was coming out of, like, hot dog stands and taxis and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, you were getting saturated by this, and it was all in the R&B station, which was amazing. So yeah, you could mix and match anything, and no one was going to give you a hard time about it. All it had to be was great. You know, of course, that's a piece of cake. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but honestly, if you're young, full of piss and vinegar, and you have something to prove, and you think you've got a great idea and an exceptional opportunity, yep. like we're working with Herbie Hancock again, you can't fuck it up. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, other thi the other thing about it is that this was literally the last record in this guy's um, term. Therefore, he was in complete don't give a fuck mode. We were all, I yeah. mean, he mm -hmm. had nothing left to lose at that point. It was, it was kind of this ultimate convergence of elements on this one point in space and time. And it just happened to hit a smack dab on the head. <laughs> it was so awesome. So let's talk a little bit about some of the instrumentation. Okay. Because you brought in some, you brought in some, uh, some aspects that were not typical even by the productions that you had done previously. No. Um, well, well, you, you, you were scrounging for some weird instruments there. Yeah, I mean, we did mess around with a lot of stuff, but, you know, I mean, some of it kind of got dropped in our laps as well. Um, excuse me, we started out the track with uh, an Oberheim DMX. I'd actually gotten the DMX DSX, which was the sequencer that Oberheim made in an OBXA, which was a great system. 
And, uh, you know, so I basically programmed the drums using the DMX. And uh, then we put bass guitar on top of it. And it was really cool because Bill had taken a vocal part from a uh, Pharaoh Saunders record called Tauhi. Um I think the track is Upper and Lower Egypt or something like that. And uh, he turned the melody into a bass line. And I can't remember, his placement of the, ba of the bass line was, I think, meant to be identical with how the vocal line was phrased. And every time he put it in, I kept, it just kept feeling wrong to me. Because he wasn't <laughs> hitting it straight on the one. It was uh -huh. like off, it was off the beat. And I just, I said, oh, you know, like, like it should start in a bump, 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 like that. And he sort of looked at me like, don't you fucking tell me what to do. <laughs> Then he played it like that, and everything started to feel right. He, was, he just sort of went along. His <laughs> but one, th one thing Damn bass players. Being a bass player yourself. <laughs> um, one of the things that he did that I hadn't seen anyone do before, and he whipped this out especially for us, you know, um, he was very theatrical that way. Like, he, put, he started... You know, he used to usually play with his fingers like that, never with a pick. This time, he was playing with his thumb in an up and down movement. Ouch. So he was kind of, he was playing, so he let the string ring just a bit, but he kind of, he sort of semi muted it with oh, the, oh, with the of top his of his thumb. Yeah, uh-huh. With the bottom, yeah. Oh, interesting. Bum, 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 bum. Like he played up and down like this. I can't possibly do, I've never had the dexterity to be able to do anything like that. So when I saw him do that, I was like, oh my God, it's incredible. Isn't that the way the guy in, uh, oh, what's the band? Chuck Green? Sheep. Sheep. Oh, did he? Yeah, Mal Rogers? No, no Bernard. Oh, Bernard. Did he yeah. play with his thumb? He did, he did do that a lot, yeah. Oh, okay. Up and down like this? I mean, I know he I, I know he popped with his thumb. Oh, he did? Oh. But, yeah. It's, I saw Chuck know. Rainey, too. Oh. Mm, with his yeah, thumb? Yeah. His, his thumb was so dexterous, I would just... Yeah, he would do upstrokes, up, up and down strokes with his thumb. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I've incredible. never seen anyone do this before. I mean, he, his thumb mm. out there. That's so hard. Mm -hmm. It's just so hard to do. So that was the bass part. And then uh, we, uh, we had a uh, percussionist come in, an Afro-Cuban percussionist named Daniel Ponce, to do conga tracks. And he comes in and brings these other drums called bata drums which are from the Afro-Cuban Kwa uh, Fong Ko tradition. And, you know, we originally envisioned conga drums, and then he whips out the bata drums, and we're like, oh shit, that's amazing, use those, use those. And I don't know if anyone in this room is familiar with, um, with Afro-Cuban style drumming, or Kwa uh, Fong Ko, but when it gets really deep, it's impossible to figure out where the one beat is. Yep. It's incredible. Yep, because it's and cycling people, around it, basically. Yeah, yeah. people mm -hmm. will sing along with it. They know where the one is. Everyone else who's playing knows where, where the one is, but you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's Something really else, disorienting. Yeah. It's really yeah. disorienting. So he lays down, he's got like a high drum and a low drum. He play, lays down one track with the high drum, and I'm kind of like, what did this guy just do? Like, this makes no rhythmic sense whatsoever. He's gonna destroy this track. Like it's just it's it's impossible to decipher, right? And then he puts down the low drum, and I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> it was like everything was in focus. Some assembly required, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. And he did it. He yeah. did it all. He was amazing. <clears throat> and uh, and these are traditional Afro-Cuban rhythms as well. So it was really it was amazing <coughs> to to see that happen. And uh, next was a turntable. <laughs> That's where it got really interesting. We'd never actually yes. recorded a turntable before. And uh, Bill had met a guy named Grand Mixer DSD, who's known now as DXD, at uh, the Roxy, doing like a, a scratching competition. And he, to this day, I don't know that there's anyone who could touch him in terms of turntable playing. He's just absolutely top of his game. And Bill got him, we actually did a, a record with him prior to this, like a 12 inch, and Bill got him to come in and do some work on Herbie's stuff. And he comes in and he's got a bunch of records, and one of the records is a Tom hit, and the other one 
is the sound of someone saying, ah, this stuff is really fresh, which is significant to me because I'd actually created that sound about, about a year and a half before for uh, a 12-inch by an artist named Fab Five Freddy. Uh, you know that one? Well, Fab Five Freddy from Rush, you know. Okay. From Rapture. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> there he is. And uh, yeah, we created this sound uh, for the end of, the, of, of his song, just kind of needing some kind of like placeholder. Yeah. That would be marginally funny, right? Ah, this <laughs> stuff is really fresh. Means absolutely nothing. So DXT comes in and he said, I'm going to use the ah and the fresh portion of this. Uh, and we're kind of like, cool, okay, what's going to happen? So he, he does the track of the tom hits. Three, there's three tom hits, and he goes to the ah and the fresh. And I don't really think there's any way to be able to explain what it was like listening to this guy lay down the turntable performance for this song, because I've been on a lot of sessions, and I have never experienced anything like that before or since. It was mind-boggling. I mean, the shit that this guy was doing with his fingers with that fucking turntable, you know, I, I mean, you have to be dexterous enough to be able to kind of like jump the needle around, Work the work the mixer, but also play the turntable. Most guys back then were just going zhik, 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 like that. This guy's like -de 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 with his fingers, which I mean is knowing what a turntable is like to envision mm -hmm. it as an instrument yeah. and then see and hear someone do that and have it be accurate. Hmm. And the, I mean, if the you accuracy heard the record, part, yeah, yeah, it's insane. If you've heard the record, you can hear what his performance sounds like. It's just it's incredible. And at that point in time, I think Bill and I, we, we didn't know that what we were in the process of creating, but there was just this, there was just this weird energy <laughs> around the track <laughs> that um, I, I'd never experienced before. Uh, and obviously we're talking about this one song, we were working on another one too, but this one sort of eclipses that one for sure. very obvious reasons and time constraints as well. Fair enough. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, but so the fresh sample, of course, has become probably one of the most sampled samples, as it were. No, actually, it is the most sampled sound in the history of recorded music. If you go on whosampled.com, there's over 2,600 and I think 64 examples of that of that sound being used. Yeah, and of course. You're collecting royalties on every single one of them, aren't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming up. Ah, yes. yes. <laughs> That's another conversation. <laughs> um, so, okay, so then we fast forward to um, what else was significant on the track before we fast forward to you actually showing this to Herbie? Because that's another fun story. Yeah, I mean, we basically built the whole track up um, in New York. Uh, we just we added a bunch of like interesting sounds after that. One of my favorite things though was trying to get a guitar stab on there because we didn't really have the technology at least uh, available to us because we're a bunch of poor guys in New York, right? I mean, we barely have a recording studio. So <laughs> to try and find an emulator or something like, I don't even know if they made those. I don't think then. the emulator, I, I think what, you was the like SPX-90 like, there yet? Because the SPX-90 nah, did a little bit of sampling, later. but that was, that was also later. That right? was later. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you had a Fairlight. You had, like, the early Synclab that didn't even have sampling. So you're talking, you had things that cost five figures, basically. Five or six. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so basically what we had was a Lexicon M93 at the prime time one. Uh, oh, someone's smiling. Uh, <laughs> one of my oh. favorite pieces of outboard gear in the known universe. It's so awesome, right? Mm -hmm. And it had, it was a delay, but it also had a repeat hold function. And if you set it the right way, you could create like what appeared to be a loop, except there was a great big, uh oh, in the middle of it. <laughs> you know, you have to hit the repeat hold button, which right. is not ergonomically designed for human fingers. Yep, yep. It's like this little, <laughs> that little piece of plastic right there. And you know you have to just hit it right then. So I just I tried to I wanted to get a guitar stab on the song. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I just thought it would sound good mixed in with everything else. And uh, 
I brought in a Led Zeppelin record and I spent hours finding the right bit. And Which? first it was like in the wrong key, it was in it was in E, so I had to tune it in the M ninety three down to A with Ooh. a strobe tuner. Ooh. A chord. Imagine how much fun that, that mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. This is like, you know, nineteen eighty three. Yep. Yeah. You know, you'd be. This is stuff that you would be able to do without even thinking about it. No, but this, but for me, it, it was. I'm gonna say it was about five hours. So you guys didn't get sued by Led Zeppelin for sampling their thing, huh? Good luck trying to find it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I can talk about it. <laughs> no, we took that out of the mix. It's not really there anymore. Yeah. No, it's it's fine. No. You would never be able to figure out what chord, what song, mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Um, so but <laughs> hey, hey, no, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> this stuff's being recorded. We can't, we can't divulge that information. <laughs> I'll just say good luck trying to find it. It's a long E chord. If anyone wants to look for a long E chord in one of the songs off Coda. <laughs> Which was then retuned to A. Which was then retuned uh -huh. to A. There's right. a whole lot of long E chords. Anyway, so I had to sit there. First I had to get the right shot. Then I had to get it into the, I had to get a shot where there wasn't as much of a hiccup in the, uh, in the loop. And then I had, to, I had to tune that shot down to A. Uh, I think at one point I just had to redo the whole thing again because I just couldn't tune it. There's so much stray in, uh, information in there yeah. to make it impossible to tune. So I did that and then I had to figure out how to trigger, which obviously you can't do back in 1983. Right, right. <laughs> Because you don't have anything that's going to key fast enough. Remember those key packs? Right, those right. So by the time you hit it, it's already passed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't mute, unmute at the console. Yeah. So I had to sit and go, boom, like that. Boom, each time I wanted the, the shot to happen. <laughs> so I had to send the whole thing back through tape, through the console, do that. Five hours, I was ready for a drink after that. Mm. <laughs> yes, let's remember we're talking about tape machines too, so you have yeah. to. Tape machines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shuttle, shuttle, right. shuttle. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that shit got done, and we ran, we actually had to transfer everything from a 16 track reel, because we only had a 16 track recorder at our studio in Brooklyn, over to 24, so we could get all these overdubs and have a large enough reel to finish up in Los Angeles with. Ah. And that's where we went next. Okay, now let's talk about Herbie because Herbie, I, I assume he knew you guys were working on something, but he also had absolutely no idea what to expect, right? None. Do tell. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the first time he heard the track was when we brought it to him. <laughs> and uh, to say he was puzzled would be a major understatement. <laughs> In fact, we had um, Dave Jordan engineering for us, and if you guys don't know, Dave is one of the greatest engineers ever. Um, Amen. Yeah, he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So Dave actually told me later that day, Herbie went up to him, and he was like, this shit's really cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we started out on a really good footing with Herbie. But, you know, I mean, he was a good sport, and besides, he'd spent some money on this already, so he knew he kind of had to follow through. So, we kind of made it real easy for Herbie. He basically, all we had to do was come up with a melody, a couple of other little overdubby type things. And, I mean, there's only a couple of sections in the song that require a melody if you really break it down structurally. One of the sections is in E, is in C, but you could play a C melody, an A melody over something like that as long as it's modal, right? Because it, you know, the, it, it's more of a, a blues-based melody anyway, or it would be ideally. We don't have the melody yet in uh -huh. this timeline, but <laughs> so we wound up standing outside Herbie's little studio in the back of his house for like 15 minutes, humming like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> and so we come on with this melody. You know, we're like, okay, we got this. He goes in, and I, I found out that Herbie, while he had every synthesizer in creation, I don't know if you knew how to correct me if I'm wrong on this, Brian. 
think he knew how to use all of them. That was my job. All right, cool. Well then, yeah, because it was my job on the session. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I can't always remember what synth, what synths we used. I mean, he had some kind of role in something there. there one of them was a Jupiter Eight, or or the rack mount version, and I can't remember what else. We used a chroma, but later on, I don't think we used a chroma on that song. But he didn't have MIDI on a lot of these instruments, so he had to play uh-huh. each track separately, which uh-huh. may sound like a really big pain in the ass, but it was really cool actually because. Each, each sound had a slightly different envelope. I mean, tonally, they're all different anyhow. So you're talking about sounds that, kind of, that come in at different times. They're also being played slightly differently because obviously you've got one of the greatest keyboard players in the world, but there's, you know, there's going to be variability. That human element. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it wound up having a very organic sound in the end. It didn't sound as synthetic as you might expect. Which was really, which was very much a uh, an asset. It kind of, it just. It it's what added. made the track. Yeah. 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 Definitely one of the one of the key things that that helped make it. So we got that, and then um, he wanted to do some scatting over the um, over the um, o- over what we laid down, and uh, you know he was just trying to figure out some stuff to do, and and Bill was like, you know, let, let's do, let's say rocket, you know, because we were also heavily influenced at that point by um, Planet Rock. Rocket don't stop it, right? So that terminology from, obviously from electro hip hop came in here and it was kind of transposed into the song and obviously gave the song its title. Uh-huh. Um, and after that he added a couple of little straight uh, vocoder overdubs. Um, the only thing, other thing that we added was like a I felt like there was it was still missing something to kind of push the track along a little bit. So I came up with a sound that was kind of a clicking sound, which I kind of because I've been listening. Obviously, everyone at that point was listening to uh, Kraftwerk song numbers, and there's a lot of uh, synthesized sounds where they they're not using they're using like a type sound for I guess to replace what you uh, do with a hi hat. Mm-hmm. Almost sounded like a typewriter. Kind of, yeah. kind of. Yeah, on their record, definitely. It's more mm-hmm. metallic, and I think they use like a digital delay with a little feedback on it, yes. so it ring. But I wanted something that would be a little bit more clearly synthetic, but more of like a clip. Not, like, not quite like a woodblock, but something that was noticeable and wasn't just like the DMX hi-hat and tambourine combination, which a lot of people had been using like that. So I created like a little rhythmic pattern. And then we discovered that we had a really big problem because we had time code on the song, but we hadn't synced any electronic time, timing stuff to it. Oops. And we were kind of like, no symptoms. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. there was, it was time code, but it wasn't, it was, it was you know. Sync to nothing, basically. Sync to nothing, yeah. basically. Yeah. There was no timing reference at all. So we were like, we can't do this. And then it turned out that Dave, knew of this guy named Dan Garfield who created this Dr. Clip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that That's saved right. a lot of people's bacon back then. He saved our bacon mm-hmm. too, I'll tell you, because he came down and he brought his Dr. Click with us and he hooked it up and we were able to sync this mini move that I programmed to the track. And we were able to run a sequence, which was incredible. And then the song was done. Oh, and Dave mixed it and then the song was done. Of course. <laughs> so... <laughs> Were you guys um, no. surprised at how well it did? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you weren't sitting there during, during the making of this and saying, this is going to be a smash. No, and anyone who says that is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can say it as much as you want, but... We, we had no idea. I mean, Herbie was still kind of like, you know, about it. <laughs> and we were sort of like, we were so proud because we've done exactly what we set out to do, and it didn't matter what anyone else think, thought, it just mattered what we thought. And we were like, wow, this is cool. I've never heard anything like this before in my life. And then we started playing it for people, other people, and they were kind of like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> we went to, uh, the day after we'd mixed it, we actually went to Electra Records to uh, a guy 
named Tom Zutat, who became ah, the guy who signed Guns N' Roses and Motley mm -hmm. Crue. And he was our A&R guy on the West Coast, because material were, were signed to Elektra. And we played him this song, and he was like, he stood, practically stood up, turned beat red, and he was like, I want this. <laughs> 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 and we were kind of like, oh shit, this is really awesome, okay. And, uh, you know, we took it home and we were kind of like, we thought that was the end of it. And two weeks later, Tony calls us and he was like, you got to do the rest of the record. You know, Herbie wants you guys to do the rest of the record. I mean, part of it was they couldn't find anyone that would have been able to create music that would have even been remotely close. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, there had to be some degree of consistency to the record, you know. Um, but yeah, so we went back and finished the record, and it was great. But we were still kind of like, all right, cool, you know. This would be a great, like, way to end Herbie's tenure at Columbia Records, and that'll be that. Mm -hmm. And obviously things didn't quite work out like that. Yeah. Okay, well, we are, we are going to... Um open it up for some Q&A because I see I see restless hands and stuff like that and hi what we're gonna play it no everybody knows it already <laughs> out or ask how much of an influence did some of the earlier 70s artists like Harlan Funkadelic and Atomic Dog and Pesh Mode in their early iterations how much of their electronica and their Creativity, uh, did you uh, find inspiring as you move forward with Herbie? With Herbie? Mm -hmm. um, At all? None? I a small just room. About none of it. Repeated. And those are all, you know, I, back then I really didn't even know who the Bash Mode were. <laughs> to be honest with you. Actually, I, they had a song on a sampler that had been put together by a French company, but it was like really old Depeche Mode back when they were using like cheap little rhythm boxes and stuff. So I had no idea what they turned into. Meanwhile, I was a big Funkadelic fan, but like, I'm not Bernie Worrell, <laughs> you know? I mean, Bernie where, Worrell... Where did, your, where did you draw it from uh, for influences on what to do with, with her? Um, the, the, I'm gonna repeat the question so that, yeah. That, that's a real, that is a really good question. The question I mean, is where you drew your influences from in terms of no, that it's record. A, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. I mean, really, like so many other people at that point, it was just free association. It was just kind of like, you know. I mean, the DMX was kind of going to be a given because it was the drum machine I had. I also preferred the sound of that over a limb drum, which is why I got it. So that's like the foundation of the record right there. Basically, like when you build, when you make a record, at least the school I'm from, the fa all the, the foundation really kind of starts to define what you put on top of it. You're not just throwing stuff piecemeal on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. But things also come together, especially if you're in a flow, and that's another place where it gets really interesting, because a lot of stuff that happens isn't necessarily stuff that you planned on, right? Exactly. It just comes in. Your, it, it just winds up dropping into your lap. Happy accidents. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily an accident. It's kind of like we could have chosen the conga drum mm -hmm. over the bata drum when Daniel came out. Why did we do it? Mm -hmm. We did it because it felt right in that moment and we both had a really visceral reaction to it. Uh -huh. Why did he bring the bata drum when we talked about conga drums? You know, this isn't, see, I, this is where we may not necessarily, we have, may have a slightly different perspective. To me, that's a, a, a question of being in flow with something and letting whatever happens take charge of the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men after lay. You know, if you, you know, if you have an idea, at least in my experience, be prepared to let it get sidetracked completely by something else that's better. Follow the process. Exactly, mm -hmm. just let it rip. Yes. As far as uh, when you start to see success from this and um, MTV comes into the picture as, as far as promoting Rocket the way it was promoted and putting it on, on air, I guess. Um, what was there like a reaction from you specifically or from her or from your team where you were like how you felt about that or like Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a whole 
Th that's a whole other thing that we. I'm not sure we have enough time for here. No, 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 but a, let's no, uh, let's quick, talk about that. The MTV this is aspect. No, yes. This is yes. This is quick because, mm -hmm. like, you know, like before the record came out, I. I I got sent the video and I put it on, and I was so pissed off when I saw this video. <laughs> I was like, Fuck this. like these people completely—they demolished any kind of vision that I had for this for this song, right? And I was like, they wrecked it, you know. Like, what do these, ink, you know, these twee English people with robots and toothpaste have to do with this fucking song? Like, you know, I mean, to me, it was like Herbie was a jazz artist. He comes from a, a, a jazz tradition, an African music. You know, we had, Af you know. Almost all the musicians on that on that song are black, you know. Like that's to me what the what the, the idea was, you know. To so to see it get kind of like hijacked in that way, I was really upset. And then of course the video hit MTV and it goes straight in heavy rotation. And after a few weeks of that, I was kind of like, well, not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's not so bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and then it started to take off, and I was like, what just happened? What is this? Like, yeah, it was crazy. Just as much as the a lot of the ways, at least how you described <coughs> going into the production <coughs> aspects were kind of maybe not groundbreaking, like if you were the first person to ever do X, Y, and Z, but it tends, seems to be like a, an unusual place where it's come from, but then also to see that take off into this now, what was probably at the time an unusual way of how music's getting blasted to people, promoted, and then how this is kind of changing eventually to see where we're at today. It's yeah. timing. Right. It's all down it to timing. It's a very strong essence of like you were right there at this place to kind of see and be part of that all this is, yeah that was his met for sure i mean and it's another example of what i was talking to this gentleman about before too it's just a matter of being in a certain kind of flow and you can feel it it's like an en you know what i'm talking about right mm -hmm. i think it's an energy that a lot of people who make records now don't get to experience but it's actually the single most important aspect in my opinion of the creative process because when you're in when you're in that you're in, when you're in that zone, everything everything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. This gentleman here has a question. It's kind of along those lines. I mean, I can sit here and ask you questions about this all day. Mm -hmm. But going back to the record drop it, I mean, compared to what was going on in hip hop, the message, Curtis Blow, Houdini, all that stuff, eighty two, eighty three, eighty four, it was different. And I remember as a kid hearing this record for the first time and going. This, this is a pop record, this is a big record, and that's not a diss at all. No, no, no. Did Columbia get it, like, right <laughs> up? <laughs> I mean, they got, they got what they wanted. They weren't expecting what they got. <laughs> they had no idea. I mean, because after that, they're kind of like, okay, you know. Well, it was simple. They heard the record, people started to hear it, and, you know, back then, people in record companies they weren't so much genre specific they were still more artists i more, more artist specific which is something that's missing from right now also yeah but you could hear you know you could listen to a piece of music and you wouldn't are we done we, I, we just got the message that we have to start wrapping up yes yeah we get the <laughs> we get the hook <laughs> 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 no, we got the we got the throat slash. That's even worse than the hook. <laughs> uh, you could you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have to listen to a piece of music and, and be able to identify it with a specific genre to know that something was up. And that's what happened with people at Columbia. They had a listening party um, at uh, for all the executives at Columbia, which I wasn't present for, but I got told about it afterwards. And Herbie's manager. Who was not Tony? Mm. Actually, who and had nothing to do with this record. Was so pissed off that he got up and walked out. And I think part of it was kind of like a, a hissy fit and trying to show, you know, a, a show of no confidence to the executives. But really, what it did was basically get him, give him, get him the boot. And Tony wound up being his manager. There you go. You know, everyone else at the record company at that point were kind of like, we're on board 150 percent with this motherfucker. That was it, you know, at that point. Because they, they could see that they, that they had something that had legs, that had vitality. And, I mean, they didn't even care about how groundbreaking it was. They just cared about the fact that someone was going to relate to it. But when they saw that video, that was like, all right, all bets are off now. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> We're set. We're good. Yeah. Fresh. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> this stuff was really fresh, man. Really fresh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we do have to wrap it. We can do one more question. I just want to know, because you're talking about culture, you used to go to the Rock Shaper Friday. At yeah. that point, did you went back when Rocky was played? Because this is early 80s when hip hop was just being put on records, pre run DMC and everything before that. Do yeah. you remember a time where it came on and your reaction being there? At the Roxy? Right, nearly, as you said. Did they, said that they, the or was it too pop at that point to be played? No, people were, people were playing it everywhere at that point. Um, so you became too pop for yourself, is what you're saying? <laughs> I don't think I said that, but you can interpret it that way if you want. <laughs> um, I don't think I, I recall ever hearing it there, but at that point it was getting the same treatment as a lot of other records, you know, like hearing it on the street and everywhere and stuff like that, and I'd just be like, my God, like I'm 23 years old, like, I was living on people's couches like four and five years before that, and I was like, this can't be happening. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're, if you're asking from that perspective, yeah, I was a real truck. Live your dream, man. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you all. Okay. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.